Well, good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to the 63rd episode of Retuning Your Firm. And we've got some really quite interesting themes today. ESG, uh, I think everybody's aware of what's going on in Glasgow at the moment with the COP conference. And so I thought it'd be interesting just to have a look at ESG maturity and the extent to which we as a sector are playing our part. Uh, the next area we're going to be looking at is non-traditional careers. And then the third area is merger tips. So welcome, everybody. And really nice to be with you today. The panel that we have today, I think, are all really interesting, exceptional people, all done amazing things in their areas. So I would like to, if I may, introduce our panelists in turn. I'd like to introduce Dana Dennis-Smith, who is the founder and chief executive of Obelisk Support. And she's going to be talking today about a topic that a lot of people kind of think about, but not everybody necessarily engages in, which is what you might call a non-traditional career. Now, whether there is such a thing as a traditional career, I'm sure will come up during the course of today's session. But anyway, she has a very interesting personal non-traditional career. And I think she is providing huge, huge numbers of mainly women, but not exclusively uh, opportunities to work in a different context as well. So we'll be hearing more about that in a minute. Our second guest today is Anne Harnity. And Anne is the managing director and founder at Johnson Beaumont, and, uh, which is a recruitment consultancy, as, as you may be aware. And they specialize in, well, some of the people are probably on the call, actually, CEOs, COOs, finance directors, working in professional services. So knows our sector probably well. And as they always say, that there's, there are two things which are very common about priests and uh, recruiters is they both run confessionals. So there's very little that's going on. I think that Anne isn't aware of. Now, you might think she's coming to talk to us today about recruitment, but actually that's not really the case. Well, in a way it is, but it's a different sort of recruitment. She's talking about when two organizations merge, come together, what's, what's the best practice? What are some tips? And um, very interesting piece of research. She just finished a book on it, which I gather is, again, worth a read, publish it, the publishers at the moment, but talking about what's best practice looking like, or maybe merger tips, but really with a strong focus on communication. Our third panelist is uh, one of our regulars, uh, Francesca Lagerberg. And she is the global leader for network capabilities at Grant Thornton International. And as you may be aware, she is on this show, but she's also uh, a, a regular on our new transatlantic show, which we had a really good session uh, a couple of weeks ago, which um, I certainly would recommend. The video's in post-production, but when it comes out, definitely worth a watch. And, and lastly, but by no means least, of course, uh, our another regular panelist, Jeremy Beard. And Jeremy is the managing partner of Hayes McIntyre, which is a, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, an accountancy firm. So over to me now, uh, Richard Chaplin. Obviously, I'm the founder and chief executive of the Managing Partners Forum. Before we get going on the actual um, show in terms of the uh, specific issues we're talking about today. I'd just like to quickly run through some of the forum news. As I mentioned, the second transatlantic show took place on the 3rd of November, and we had Ju Professor Julian Birkinshaw of the London Business School talking about disruption and saying, well, hang on, why is it that we always think disruption is a dirty word? Because actually sometimes it's positive. And we also had Tim Murphy, who is uh, on the one hand, a partner of a law firm, Macmillan in Toronto. He's also the former chief of staff to the Canadian prime minister. So he was talking a little bit about what is it that law firm leaders could learn from politicians? Really, really interesting stuff. The regulars, well, the regulars were uh, obviously Francesca, I mentioned, and then Dr. Larry Richard. And I think Francesca and Larry have kind of agreed they share the same brain. Fascinating to see the way they work together. So videos in post-production, that will be available shortly, and I'll obviously drop you a note. Whilst I'm talking about videos, don't forget to watch them. There are literally hundreds of people watching the videos from past shows. So there's no point in missing out. And some of them might go about 18 months even, and they're still popular. They suddenly pop up. I think somebody sticks something on LinkedIn, maybe. I'm not sure. Either way. Um, we've been running uh, some roundtable topics on uh, management practices, if you recall. And uh, the next section is looking at innovation and productivity, which is something that everybody talks about and government finds that country is struggling with. And this is really coincide with the launch of the Fast Track Innovation Guide and the Bespoke Sprint. So you'll be hearing lots more about that from us very, very shortly. Um, we're also going to be launching a new service, which I'm calling Mentor Match, which is really about helping you find a mentor or a mentee or both 
from another organization. Uh, mentoring within an organization is well established. It's less common across organizations. So that's something that, again, I think will be really interesting to roll out quite soon. Uh, peer groups continue to go from strength to strength, 100% uh, renewals, as you know. And last but no means, this show is fortnightly. We have one more this year, and then we'll be back in January because I think running them in December is probably not going to work too well. So what are we cheering about at the moment? Well, there's some feedback from UK government, which is, I think, quite powerful, which says that, as you can probably read, your poll results are incredibly valuable in our analysis during these dynamic times. So let's just quickly run through the, the poll that uh, some of you completed uh, last week, hopefully most of you. Um, and this was about innovation, uh, if you remember. And I kind of thought, well, actually, what I'm really looking at is innovation maturity or lack of. Um, so what do we said? Well, it was seen as essential for three things, really. Essential for enhanced productivity. It was seen as important for growth. And it was also seen as a key touch point with clients. Well, there, there are very few things which take quite so many of those pos positive places, I think. Uh, in terms of impact, it was seen to be have most impact on the area of employee engagement. That was the one thing that really, if you were seen to be an innovative firm, your people would feel much more positive about working for you. Uh, and this again was where the sort of contrast came in. We asked right at the outset, okay, to what extent do you consider your firm to be mature? And the simple answer was, well, it's reasonably mature around innovation. And yes, there are suitably senior people driving innovation. However, 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 it's always a but, isn't there in life? What I found was that actually, when you actually started analyzing and talk about some of the processes for innovation or the extent to which, for example, they have a fully documented innovation strategy, um, there were rather fewer people left in the room. So I'm not sure how you can be mature without those core elements in place. Um, I think what typically happens, in fact, is that innovation is mostly being left to specialists. So a team of people go away and do the innovation and people are being kind of generally encouraged to share ideas as they're pushing out ideas. Well, that is important, but it's not the same as a structured approach. I think that's the point I'd make. And in terms of the way that people are actually, what are the tools they're using? Innovation teams are by far and away the most popular tool that people are using. So, so those were the sort of key findings from the poll, which you kindly completed last week. I'll, I'll just show a few of the slides. And uh, then I think they're probably not very clear to you in the sense it's quite busy, but essentially it's zero at the bottom and 10 at the top. And the question was, you know, how mature do you think your firm is? And if you were 10, you were up there amazing. And if you were zero, someone down towards the bottom. And if I look at that, five, six, seven is pretty much, um, or six, seven, eight rather to be exact, is very much the area where people see their firm to be at. And if I follow through, this one's a bit easier to see. On the right, it's the central precondition. In the middle, it's import next important, but not essential. Nice to have, and then unimportant on the left. So everybody recognizes it's important, and it's essential precondition. Say so two thirds of firms uh, for enhanced productivity. When it comes to clients, not quite so much on the right, but still a pretty big chunk. A few people saying it's nice to have. Um, which I, I think they must have interesting clients because I think most clients would find innovation, innovative firms. But we did have an interesting conversation on the, the US firm about innovation, account, innovative accountants. And Francesca pointed out that could mean if you were a tax expert, you ended up being locked up in jail. So there are some limitations possibly there. But either way, it's clearly something that is important to clients and, and also similar sort of percentages around growth and market share. So, so you've got fairly clear message coming back from you that this is the way you see it. Um, I was going to show you this last one. This is really the one about culture and innovation. And about 80%, I think it is, right at the top are saying, yeah, we are encouraging our people to share ideas. Well, that's a bit called, that's called broadcasting. It's a bit like us. We've got a studio audience, then we've got lots of people watching on YouTube. We are broadcasting to you. Uh, that's not the same as actually working with people interactively, design sprints, whatever, in order to get from A to B. Uh, and then we start getting into much lower numbers. So a third are talking about we foster a culture of innovation. Then we're in the 20% seeing we outcomes regularly from innovation activities. Uh, and our people are fully aware of our culture of innovation. When you drop down to are they engaged in that culture, then you're into single digits virtually. And, and the fact that someone's accountable single digits and we have a fully documented innovation strategy about the same. So this to me is not a mature uh, position. Anyway, let's move on. Today's poll. 
Um, given COPs happening in Glasgow, and the I know it's probably going to be extended as these things, they run it to the sort of midnight and then they decide to extend the day until the conference ends. So that's quite an interesting concept, but certainly they did that in some of the previous ones, Paris, etc. So what we're going to talk about, what I want you to do is just kind of do a, a straw poll of kind of understand what's your ESG maturity like as a firm. Uh, I did this poll with you about, about 15 months ago, I think it was maybe 18 months ago, so back in May of last year. So it'll be quite interesting to see whether in the past year things have materially changed, whether the fact that I think 85% of countries now have said they have a zero carbon policy, whether they are actually going to put the mechanics to make it happen is a moot point. So today's poll is about ESG maturity. And really what we're trying to do here is to find out a couple of things. First of all, do you have a dedicated committee or specialist helping you in that space? And then to what extent are you measuring and sharing a whole number of different areas? So the switch to renewables, uh, processes that conserve resources, your carbon neutrality, uh, zero carbon, if you want, the health and well-being for your people, because remember that S is social, not E alone, and G is governance. We'll come to that in a sec. The equality of opportunity, gender diversity and inclusiveness, the EDI, it's now increasingly called, I believe. Uh, this, the extent to which compensation levels of leaders and employees are being shared and the diversity of the leadership team, because all these are quite important signals. And then rather than just pushing out and sharing, to what extent are clients coming to you and seeking information on what I would call your ESG performance? Um, so let's have a look what's coming up. I have to look away to watch this so we can all see it, hopefully. So the first question was, uh, if you recall, do you have a dedicated committee or specialist? And about 40%, a bit less, have such a person in place. About 20% say there is no plans to do so. And about 40%, uh, a bit less, are uh, looking at doing something either within the next six months or a little bit further afield. So that's the first one. So we're now talking about... Um, various aspects of the E of the ESG, the environmental one. So to what extent are firms switching to renewable or clean sources of energy? And the biggest one there uh, by fair amount is efforts. We're making efforts, but we're not actually measuring our performance. That's the message that comes through fairly strongly on that one. Um, and 15% say it's not seen as a priority. I mean, I think compared with other industries, like we had Chris Blythe from the construction industry a few weeks ago, and he was saying about 50% of the emissions all come from buildings. So whether we, a bit like airline travel is 1%, so professional firms are going to be significantly less than 1%. So let's move on. Number three, uh, conserving resources, very, very similar. We're doing it. We're really making an effort, but we're not trying to measure our performance. And again, as we kind of know, somebody once memorably said, what gets measured gets done. So maybe more work needs to be in that space. If I move forward to the point about going carbon neutral, zero carbon, again, same sort of comments, same sort of pattern emerges, a bit over half. We're making efforts, but no measurement of our performance. For 15%, it's not seen as a priority, and then others are in between. But almost nobody is measuring it. 20% is actually measuring it and sharing it with their people. If I come through to uh, now more traditional, the S part, the social piece, um, we're now looking at the health and well-being of your people. And yes, that one is more measurement. Nobody's saying it's not a priority. That's a relief. 30% uh, of people are saying that they are making some efforts, but not measuring it. 30% are measuring it and getting on for 40% are actually measuring and sharing it. Um, nobody's sharing it externally, by the way, which is a surprise, because I think actually if you're looking at it from the point of view of potential candidates, potential, and um, we'll talk to Hiran maybe later, a recruiter, but you know, knowing that this firm I might be working for it has got um, good health and well-being of the employees of the policy and it's being measured and shared, could be worth sharing, and clients as well, possibly. Certain clients may well be very interested in knowing that that's your policy. In terms of EDI, the equality of opportunity, the gender diversity and inclusiveness, we do have some people who say it's not seen as a priority, uh, which is a bit strange, but there you go. Um, sorry, I should never, never, never criticize the people who complete your polls, very poor strategy. But the main thing that comes out is that, yes, it is being measured, uh, but it's only being shared with the partners and senior management. So um, that's 30%. So yeah, we've got it, but we're not letting anybody see it. Well, not a very good strategy either, I suspect. 
um, twenty percent measuring it with the people, and twenty percent are actually sh uh, sharing it externally. So it the bit, but the biggest one is people who are measuring it but not actually sharing it, uh, although they're sharing it with the partners and senior management. In terms of the compensation levels, there's always an interesting area. Again, same sort of pattern emerges. <clears throat> We're talking here about optics associated with the levels. We're not necessarily talking about the numbers themselves, but the whole optics associated with them. And are they being measured and shared? And nothing externally, zero, 15% to your employees, uh, but a big chunk, 54%, obviously, with partners and senior management. Uh, when it then comes to the partners, uh, partner compensation, much bigger chunk. 20% uh, say it's not a priority, interestingly. Um, nobody's sharing it externally. Uh, and uh, a big chunk, 70%, are only sharing it amongst themselves as a group. So what about the diversity of the board and executive committee, the leadership team, if you like, many of the people who are watching the show today? Well, efforts are being made, but there is no measurement of the performance, 40%. Some measurement, but nothing's being shared. Now, one could argue the sharing is less important because in many cases, if you put up a group of pictures, it's kind of clear uh, a number of um, gender, ethnic background, et cetera, is pretty clear if you've shown pictures, but not all firms are doing that. So there is clearly a, uh, an issue there around if you are looking to uh, encourage your clients to hire you because you are a firm which has uh, a good ESG, and this is the G part, obviously the governance, then uh, this is something that you might want to bear in mind. But equally, we all know that this takes quite a long time to move the dial. And all too often what you find is that it's the, what's sometimes called proxy metrics, the ones in between, how do you measure the steps that you make and celebrate a movement in the right direction, which actually gets you to a good place. Finally, to what extent are the clients actually trying to, we've found out that they're not sharing much with your clients. So to what extent are they trying to find information from you on your ESG performance? 15%, not at all. 30% hardly at all, 46% to some extent, 8% to some, to a significant extent. Now, this is quite interesting in competitive advantage terms, because if there is indeed clients that are interested in this area and seeking information, it may not be the significant extent, but even to some extent, 46%. That to me suggests that the firm that actually is willing to put their head above the parapet and share at this sort of information will be seen to be differentiating themselves in a way that possibly they could find difficult in other contexts. So that's another thought for your particularly marketing teams maybe. So I'll stop sharing now. I think that's been a really interesting poll. Um, we may well pick it up as the uh, session continues, but I'll leave that entirely up to you. And I'd now like to invite our first guest to come and talk to us. And if you recall, uh, it's the Dana Dennis Smith, who is the founder and chief executive of Obelisk Support. And I shall, and she's coming to talk about a very simple concept of non traditional careers, but I think it's quite a complex area, uh, which she has personal experience and is a hugely important influencer and intermediary in helping others achieve effective non traditional careers. So I'd now like to invite Dana to come and talk to us for five minutes. Over to you. Well, thank you. Thank you for inviting me um, to speak to you today. Um, let me start with the start of my legal life. Um, I started my legal education on 9-11. Um, as you know, a pretty uh, important day in the world. Um, but the reason why I'm telling you this is because when I was in the room ready to go and start learning about the law, having studied um, history as a, an undergrad, um, I really wanted to be somewhere else, as in I wanted to be in my previous career, which, which was journalism. It felt like the moment to be what I wanted um, to escape from. So I started my working life too many years ago to mention, and I went straight into journalism out of high school. The days when you could get a job without requiring, um, a, well, I don't know, a PhD really. If you wanted to be a journalist, you just need to be able to find a story and write it up. Um, and uh, I spent about 10 years um, being a journalist. My last job before 9-11 uh, time, I was with the Economist Group. So I was quite you know, content and I probably had the career that many people are trying to write um, would have dreamt of and um, envied to some degree. But I had different ideas and I decided that the city lights were calling me and I needed to go and train to be a city solicitor. And I trained with Linklater's. 
And as you can imagine, you couldn't have a bigger contrast between the freedom of journalism roaming around, meeting lots of people, and really the only thing that mattered was output. Do you have a good story? Are you on time? Are you ahead of the competition? And um, link leaders where I felt tied to a chair pretty much 24 um, seven, every day of the week. It didn't matter that I had a life. It didn't matter I was married. Nothing mattered other than the job itself and being present on floor six or whatever uh, number I was on. So I left very soon after qualifying. I qualified as an employment lawyer. I learned a few things around how workplace relationships break down and how they really affect people in their personal lives. So I kind of learned what I felt I could learn and I decided to strike out by myself and be free again. <laughs> and I became an entrepreneur. So I set up a business, nothing to do with law. I mean, a little bit to do with law because it was a compliance um, business specializing in emerging markets. And I entered the world of um, political risk and writing and actually applying my legal education and my legal knowledge, but to the world that I escaped on 9-11 and um, I learned about running a business that way and I found that I wasn't too bad at it and uh, one day I had this light bulb moment as we all do when we decide to be entrepreneurs and that was to re-engage um, a lot of the women that were dropping out of the legal profession and bring them back to deliver flexible and affordable legal support to enterprise clients. The same clients that I had serviced when I was in the city, but that needed to address, I think, the challenge of the post Lehman Brothers collapse world of increasing regulation, increasing um, legal work, and not enough people doing it, or not sufficiently affordable to be able to be done, Many of them outsourced to offshore jurisdictions, but I had this idea that we can um, outsource to people's homes. And that was my, if you like, my value proposition when I came into the market was to say remote first, what's wrong with where the people are working from, if the environment is secure, if they're able to fit it around their family, if it is flexible, but you not suffering the consequences of their flexibility, because my business's role is to make it a smooth um, delivery channel for the work then what's the problem? And uh, that's really what I started um, to do with my business. So Obelisk started with four lawyers that were desperate to work and they were all women and they had had their children and they felt completely let down by the legal profession because they were forced out. They were forced into a zero sum game. They couldn't have it both ways. And uh, they were, you know, their brains were perfectly powerful and ready to engage. So. We found work for them as a starting point. We now have over 2000 people on the platform working primarily, I mean, 100% remote really at the moment, but it wasn't smooth play, you know, sailing from the beginning because although I understood the value of output over input because I had done it as a journalist, I also understood the value of not having unnecessary pressure put on people. For example, being in the office at 9 a.m., it was arbitrary, it wasn't needed. If you had a meeting, fine. But if you didn't have a meeting, what's the point of making people rush and stress and sweat it all out to arrive in the office, exhausted before the day even begins? Similarly, picking them up, picking children up from school or from nursery, again, it was the usual struggle. And people were not happy and they were quitting rather than staying connected. And my job was to find a way to give them the flexible solutions, but also always keep the client at the front of the mind. So what can I tell you about traditional careers? I mean, obviously I, didn't, I don't believe in, in traditional <laughs> careers as a concept. And that, that's because I think there's two things that I tend to do and I do that with my business and the people that are coming through and are helped by my business. And that's as follows. I see careers as a st strategic direction. You know, I see it as a series of jobs. So for me, when I set up in journalism, I obviously I had every intention of staying in journalism for the long term. Um, but how I went about what kind of journalism I wanted to be involved with was basically the result. It was a result in a number of jobs. So I ended up, you know, working with Reuters. I worked up with the BBC. I worked up, you know, worked with the Economy. So I found that I decided on the nature of the work that I wanted to do, and I moved jobs. But at the end of the day, they were part of the same strategic decision, which was that I wanted to pursue a career in journalism. Similarly, when I was a lawyer, I had the same idea. I wanted to be a city lawyer, and that was the strategic decision. That was the career direction, if you like. 
But in terms of tactical moves, I had, you know, a number of decisions that I take and, you know, for example, taking the Linklater's job rather than the other offers I had, because I felt as somebody born in Eastern Europe, they seem to be committed to the region, I could bring some value to them. Um, and when I left and I decided to be an entrepreneur, it was part of the same kind of idea. Longer term, I want to do something that involves me managing something of my own, but actually beyond my own kind of, you know, not a sole practitioner, but I wanted to build something of scale. Can I do it? So if you like, I always pose the challenge of what is the strategy? What, what is the destination? And then I find different tactical moves to create the, um, you know, to back it up and be able to achieve that, that aim. So I don't really believe that career is the one step. I think it's made up of many jobs and many directions and it's always zigzagging. And I think even when you become a partner, you know, in a law firm, sometimes you get direct to Hong Kong for a few years just because it kind of gives you the right kind of experience of maybe setting up a new office or something. It's all about skinning up in a different way. Um, and at the end of the day, I think career is a series of steps that you take towards a destination and you can change the destination. You might want to add a few skills, but at the end of the day, it's a strate strategic decision. It's not purely tactical. And I wish women, women in particular, took a more strategic view of their careers and the direction of travel. It was fantastic. Thank you so much, Dana. And uh, as I said, it, it's a really interesting. I kind of think of it a little bit like sailing, if you're familiar with sailing, where uh, if you want to uh, sail against the wind, the only way to do it is to tack left, right, left, right, left, right, and hopefully then end up in the port. And the only key thing is you do actually need to know where you're going and where the port looks like. And that's where the strategy can sometimes fall apart. So uh, thank you for that. And we'll pick up, I'm sure, some of those points in the panel session once we've heard from our second guest today. And our second guest today is Anne Harnity. And Anne, as I mentioned before, is the Managing Director and Founder at Johnson Beaumont, a recruitment consultancy. Richard, thank you very much indeed. Um, and you're right, I do have a recruitment business, but I also have a merger integration business. And we found that when we have been out speaking to clients about that integration, we have heard the same issues regardless of the size of the firm. So we did undertake research to try and find out why those issues are recurrent could our research help others avoid the same issues because it came from a peer group and that right research has led to us writing a book mergers with the benefit of hindsight now robin sharma the canadian writer said the real trick is to turn hindsight into foresight that reveals insight and the biggest insight we found where merger hinges on success or failure is communication simply because it impacts every single area of the business and George Bernard Shaw said this the single biggest problem in communication is the illusion that it's taken place because none of us believe we communicate badly if I put my recruiter's hat on every CV I've read I think over 30 years will always say something about how fantastic that person's communication skills are and it should be easy a sender, a message, and a recipient. But that's not communication, that's sending a message. And that's what we forget because communication has to involve listening and it has to involve acting on feedback. So our research showed that communication has three key areas of impact that I'll discuss today. So partners, staff, and clients. So let me start with partners. Well, communication starts from the minute you start talking about a merger and it comes from the top. We all know there's seldom a merger of equals in M&A. One firm is usually dominant, but it's good PR to refer to them as mergers simply because it makes everyone feel better. But I did have one managing partner in the research say to me, we never say we acquire a firm. You acquire things and not people. And I think that speaks volumes to his communication style. Now, partners need a compelling reason to merge. They need to understand the vision for the merged entity. So how that's communicated to them is absolutely key. And if we think about that George Bernard Shaw quote and that illusion of it uh, taking place, I was given a great example by the CEO of a global law firm. Now, they put together a prospectus for their partners, outlining the issues to be considered in a major merger. Um, by all accounts, it was a beautifully presented document. But at every meeting to discuss it, partners complained they weren't aware, it hadn't been debated before, they didn't understand where this had come from. 
So they had to find out why this was happening. And when they did find out, the reason was only one in 10 of their hundreds of partners had actually read this beautifully prepared prospectus. And I think if we're being really, really honest, most of us would have probably had a quick look and then put this beautiful document in a bottom drawer to preserve it. So sending documents or emails might not be the best way to communicate, but it might be part of your communication plan. But the problem is when you've taken the trouble to prepare a document so well, here's that illusion of a job well done. And what about communication with staff? Well, in reality, few people actually meet before a merger. Partners obviously do, and probably your finance directors do. So people start to work for a new firm when they haven't emotionally chosen to leave their existing firm. And that won't cause an issue where that individual's hierarchical position isn't put under threat, but absolutely expect resistance when it is. And when communication's poor, there is an issue of losing key staff, which obviously disrupts the whole point of a merger. A managing partner said to us, no wonder there was a continuous stream of people fighting to leave. We had backstabbing associates, we had warring partners, downtrodden PAs, and two directors for every business operation function, all jockeying for position, because they made the error of waiting until after the merger deal was signed to decide what to do with those key roles. You need to have a plan in place from day one of the merger about key positions so staff understand what's happening and they trust what it is that you're telling them. And what about client communication? Well, integration when you do a merger takes up swathes of time and energy to the extent it is really easy to assume that you've communicated with clients. And a CEO of a London firm told me, we didn't have a plan on how we inform clients. We left it to individuals and that was an error because there was no strength or depth to the message. So if you're not prepared, you will have a communication vacuum. And the merger is a time for constant and consistent client communication. How do you gain a 360 degree view of your clients from across a merged firm? How do you unlock those collaborative opportunities across the firm to deliver a better client experience? And how do you deliver that message to your clients? Have you thought how you're going to include your client in messages to ensure you secure their long-term loyalty? And I was given a wonderful, a really wonderful analogy from one participant in our research who brought in management consultants to consider how the merger would impact on their clients. And that consultancy started their presentation with a slide and it showed a row of generic baked bean cans. And they were told, if you don't have a vision for your clients, that's how you're going to be perceived. Nothing different, you're just gonna sit there with every other firm. And that very stark image and message sparked debate on what it was the client really wanted and how to communicate the changes that would be of benefit to them. And because for many firms, the whole point of m a is to gain clients and to strengthen those relationships. So in conclusion, I would say this, remember com communication starts from the second you debate M&A. And our advice is have a very strong and thought through communications plan, which will benefit you. And don't assume that people at all levels are on side if you tell them something once or even twice. Your messages need to be consistent and they need to be ongoing to avoid that illusion of communicating really well. Thanks, Richard. Oh, thanks very much. And that was great. And um, I sort of, as I said, I think I kind of people often forget that wonderful question, why? I mean, when you're a child of two, you ask why, 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 why? <laughs> Nobody says, why are we doing this merger? Well, they don't do it enough, I suspect, because everything else then kind of falls apart. Right, we're now moving to the panel session. So um, welcome everybody again. And I'd like to start by inviting Francesca to uh, share her thoughts on today and uh, see where the conversation takes us. Excellent. Thank you, Richard. No, lovely to be uh, on the panel today and to, to listen to those two conversations. Um, and let me start with Dana, because, um, oh, my goodness, have I been part of some of those environments working on my own, working with other teams, working in environments where it seems impossible to do the job and working in environments that have been really embracing of what it could be. And I just want to pick up one tiny aspect of that is that the, the, ta the need for to attract talent to a um, to an organization at the moment, it's never been greater. I've never 
known such a set of circumstances where talent attraction hasn't been top of almost every conversation. So if you're going to be attractive to talent, be you a one-man band, a two-man band, or a massive organization, what are you doing to enable your people to have an experience that is both rewarding for the clients and rewarding for them? But, and it sounds so simple, much more difficult to achieve. But if we've learned anything for the last 18 months, I think we know that we can do some things a little bit differently. So there's a lot there to explore around how do you make things really, really attractive, both in terms of the person running the business, because, you know, nothing, you can't do absolutely everything that everybody wants, but can you make it an attractive place to keep people? So that is huge. And of course, mergers and acquisitions. I love a bit of MA. It's one of the teams I run uh, in my current role. And we do mergers all over the world. Um, and I think you're absolutely right, Anne, in terms of the communication piece. And I do love the quotes and the fact that most people think they've been awesome at communicating. And actually, they've been very good at communicating in their own head. Um, and uh, they've done a very good job on that. Nobody else knows what's going on. One sort of uh, extra element to that, which I'm sure you see a lot in the work that you do, is coming up with a combined culture post uh, post integration in, in any merger and, and it always reminds me of a, a big merger that we did <clears throat> in our German firm and two, two really really good firms coming together one significantly bigger than the other and the firm that was coming in is about 280 people were joining uh, the existing legacy firm and of those 280 people coming in very different culture very different background but huge business synergies for why they should come together. And uh, I remember a fantastic meeting I was sitting in where the incoming firm said, this is our culture, this is what we have. And the legacy firm goes, well, this is our culture, this is what we had. And then and it just a, sort of just a beautiful um, explanation of what it was all about. The incoming firm said, we know we need to change our culture in some ways, keep the good, but change our culture as we come into you but we don't think that you need to keep your culture exactly the same either. We need to create a common culture together. And they went on, joined together, been hugely successful as a combined firm. And they really took the time to go through that cultural piece. They were, what were the values that were important to both sides? And they, but they created something together. It wasn't as though one just imposed their view on the other, or one felt they were giving up everything that had made them special in the first place. And, and that feels a huge part of that communication piece as well not just around how you're going out to the clients, but how you're talking to your people about what that new world really looks like. And I, I always remember that conversation and how um, important it was for their successful integration as well. So we would love you to hear what Anne has to say on that too. Thank you, Richard. Oh, thank you. Thank you very, very much, Francesca. And I, and I love those stories. It's great. I remember years ago, um, and I was working at the time in one of the big four and they had one of the big mergers. And uh, I think it was the German firm who politely sent back all the 360 degree feedback forms because we do not do this in Germany. Uh, <laughs> that's the challenge you have when you're working in a world where it's the brand rather than the profits which is being shared. So I'd now like to invite Jeremy. Now, Jeremy, you can have a conversation about any of the things. You can pick up some of the points maybe around ESG we talked about possibly as well. So over to you, sir. Okay, thank you, Richard. Good morning, Good morning everyone. And thank you to Dana and Anne for their contribution. Very, very interesting. Just a couple of comments that I picked up on uh, from, from each of them that, that perhaps worth mentioning. Um, for, first of all, uh, Perhaps Francesca's comment about attracting talent at the moment, um, and I'd entirely agree with, with, with Francesca. I don't think, it, certainly in my professional career, I've seen it like it is at the moment. What I would say is when we talk about attracting talent, let's not forget the talent we've already got in our business. So it's very easy when we're looking outside and recruiting to be very proactive and think uh, outside the box a little bit, but, but perhaps sometimes we get a little bit complacent with regard to the existing talent we have in our organization. And, you know, retention at the moment is, is critical. Um, so, so not to forget what we need to do in that regard. I think just picking up on, on Dana's points, you know, we have to be flexible at the moment. We, we have to, um, listen to what um, employees and potential employees want, how they want to work, uh, what, what is good for them in their 
in, in their personal life and their work life balance. And we have to listen and we have to accommodate that. Um, it, it, interesting, I, I think a couple of comments that Donna made was you, you couldn't have it both ways back in the day. Well, we have to accommodate that now as employers. You have to find a way of, uh, of satisfying those, those points. And the other point that I liked was, was, you know, valuing output and not input. Increasingly, we should recognize the output that is, that is produced and, and, and not, not be hung up by presenteeism and, 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 and time input, et cetera, et cetera. So what are, what are people producing? What is the output that they're producing for us and, and, and making sure we, 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 we take that on board. In terms of Anne, I, I suppose mergers aren't really on our, our radar. Um, the last merger, significant merger we did as a firm was the bringing together of Hayes and McIntyre, which was in 2001, 20 years ago, unbelievably. Um, and and it, it's not something that's on our radar at the moment. But I, what I would say is probably all the comments that, that Anne made and Francesca's made um, apply when you've got key transition events as well so at the moment we are looking at our strategy as a firm you know and and things in that strategy will be around how we do things differently going forward and those key transition events also lead to all those important things that that we talk about around a merger so that communications piece um consideration of the impact on on the staff of any changes what that impact is on their day-to-day -day life, working life, while we're trying to transition certain things, as well as what the end game is, what the goal is at the end. So, you know, I, I wouldn't just um, cut off what Anne said or what Francesca said, because your merger is not on your agenda. Um, there, there are other things within your business where those comments are, are absolutely applicable as well. Thanks, Jeremy. And I mean, I think, yeah, the, the part, the importance of communication is something that we all recognize as being essential in the, in the sense that, uh, you know, yeah, whether you're inverted commas, pre sharing the benefits of a merger or whether you're sharing the benefits of, I don't know, say expansion to a new area, they're not that far apart, actually, in practice. Um, staying with strategy, I'd like to perhaps now um, put a question to Dana. Um, and you talked in your uh, session on your the slot down around the whole area of uh, having a sort of, if you like, a, a career goal or a plan and then setting your strategy. But I, I've come across quite a few people in life who kind of, I won't say they're happy to say they have no strategy. That isn't quite true, but they don't really necessarily want to look too far into the future. They just want to uh, sort of, you know, keep, keep on trucking and then see what comes over the horizon. So how, how would you, how do you, how do you see a career developing when somebody has that mindset? Um, so, I mean, I, I see where, where you're coming from, but I haven't really found people that become leaders be that accidental in their choices. I think maybe they're not speaking up about how they go about, you know, aspiring or they're trying to lead with humility. But in my experience of people that I find at leadership level, maybe they were not very clear about where they wanted to land when they were teenagers or you know, a 10 or something. But once they embarked on their first step in a career, they started to be quite directed and quite ambitious, uh, maybe quietly ambitious. But I didn't, I haven't really come across anybody that's been really just kind of being promoted accidentally. Maybe that might have been the case, you know, 40, 50 years ago, where you could just kind of walk in and people would just say, you're fantastic. And, you know, we'll just give you lots of great um, things. But now being a leader is so much more complex. I mean, we heard about communications, about, you know, all these other aspects. You need to be, you know, good with numbers, good with this. So it's not, you've got to be way more rounded and more able to lead in a very different way. So I think being a kind of, I don't really know what I'm good at, won't get you anywhere. And people need to be able to define what they're good at. And it, that is actually part of the strategy, being able to say, well, I'm good at this and I'm not so good at that. And um and be able to surround yourself with the right people that are complementary. So I maybe don't meet the right people. I probably know more people at a very senior level than I do, but the ones that I've met, they are much more direct than let out, I find. 
Fine. And I'm staying with that point for a second. I think possibly it's an issue around managing the people and maybe the people who come to work for Obelisk are self-selecting because they are people who are looking for that sort of career shift. And you have a sort of more of a broader perspective around the people who you work with. And some of them are sort of clearly going to be aspiring to leadership, but others perhaps are not. So, so how, do you, how, does, how, does, how do you think that that leadership might approach those issues when you have people who aren't quite as career focused as we were talking about a minute ago? I have to say the people I meet are very career focused and they drive towards that whole uh, thing. And I, I think before we, we started the debate today, um, Francesca was saying, you know, when we recruit, is it a small pool of, of women that we have to choose from? And, and sadly, yes, it is. And I think to, to actually grow uh, women in roles in particular or get more, more diversity, the sector has to be prepared to come outside sector to bring fresh talent in because if they constantly hunt in a tiny pool of people and they're not refreshing that tiny pool of people it gets stagnant very quickly it's interesting a lot of the big firms are bringing in people with a more commercial background to have commercial acumen um, and I think that really does need to change to radically change what's going on in some professional services firms. And of course from your point of view you've been working with professional services particularly in the um the business professionals, and if you go back 20, 30 years in some of these areas, marketing, possibly less than HR, but operations, knowledge, there was nobody. Tech, I mean, there were the partners, there were the EAs, and that was about it, really. Yeah. Uh, obviously, the people. Um, so, so, so in a sense, we're not really talking about something new here. We're talking about something that actually has been happening within our profession in terms of bringing in people who are running the business rather than running the client relationship. So um, if you sort of seen that that is are firms more open to those when it comes to diversity and other agendas or is it still around the more technical skills no they are more open that that's for sure and I think it's really interesting that Harvard are starting to do a course I'm sure you're aware of this on business operations people and giving them different qualification and how that will impact on businesses so I think yeah it's it's been there in HR and marketing for a long time um I think it probably started with women and it's now more diverse we get more men as well so it's, it's interesting how that's evolved over a period of time and I've been in recruitment over 30 years and you're right I've certainly seen it, that evolve hugely. Uh, Francesca just kind of picking up this point around uh, people from different backgrounds and somehow are trying to manage that if you are bringing in these whether it's an operational specialist or somebody who isn't your traditional tick the box accountant um how how, do, how have firms been flexing their management to cope with that much more possibly challenging opportunity um well i think it is definitely around opportunity rather than challenge richard to be honest um the the the, the dni explosion uh, always makes me smile because a lot of people have dni programs very few people have DNI as really part of their DNA because um, it's hard. It's about change management. And if you want to have the same bunch of people, look the same, sound the same, talk the same, think the same, yeah, go and get those baked beans, really. Um, uh, that, that's, that's unfortunately been perhaps the model for many years. Um, when you start trying to have a, a much broader, more thoughtful approach, um, plenty of research to show how much more commercially effective you are, but also it does mean you're likely to have conflict and um, it means that you need to be willing to have that constructive conflict because people will think differently and challenge perhaps something that someone has held on to for 20, 30, 40 years and they'll be getting a very different mindset. I was on the most amazing uh, d &I event. It was actually an internal event, but we had some fantastic external speakers yesterday and I just sat there going, crumbs, there's so much to do around this whole area. But the one that perhaps struck me the most was um, a, an amazing uh, partner that we have in our Irish firm called Sinead. And, and Sinead is, is actually now the chairman of the Irish firm. But she's, she's just an extraordinary individual, thoughtful, passionate. And she goes throughout my career, um, that she didn't describe it, she described it a lot better than this. I, I felt other, you know, I've been the only woman in the room or I've been the only person with kids in the room or have been the only person. And she went through a whole series of scenarios about what it's like to be other. But she said, look at me now. I'm, I'm in the privilege category now. Um, I'm, I'm actually someone who's actually in the establishment. So there's other people I'm dealing with now who are other. And how, how you know, I, I need to bring the knowledge that I had when I was 
starting out and not lose that because anybody, anyone on this call is actually in a privileged position. How do you help those people, different social stratas, different backgrounds, different education, different um, uh, routes, whatever it is that has made them feel that they're not part of the mainstream? How do you really bring that alive? And the thing I think is I felt most compelling about the conversation yesterday was just how many people had an amazing story to tell when they would felt isolated and alone. And, and you take that and you go, well, actually so many people have had that experience. How can you bring that knowledge together and actually use it to make sure that you do less of it in the business environment? You don't lose that sense of what it's like to be the outsider, but actually you make it um, something that helps you to understand how to be more inclusive in what you do. And it's, it's a very complicated area. It is not about just coming up with some scheme, sticking the label DNI on it and hoping that does the job. But um, it's just vital. It's absolutely vital to create a good working environment. Can uh, I just Jeremy, quickly, sorry, yeah. come in there because um, your story of the first and only one is exactly what I basically latched onto and storytelling to when I created the first 100 years campaign. It was about the, you know, basically recording the life stories of the first woman and exactly what you describe. Obviously I focus on the legal profession, but the centenary of women in the profession was the same for accounting and all of other, all the professions were close to women before 1919. And I, like you, identify that storytelling and that historic knowledge as the medium for which we could engage both men and women in the story, because men were staggered by the stories they could hear. They, they were like, wow, that, I, <laughs> that happened to you and you're my colleague today and you are my, you know, my colleague in leadership today. Um, and they became very aware of what happened before and how long women have contributed. So I definitely, we've definitely tackled it in this method in, you know, with my charity hat on. And it's incredibly uh, fascinating. And we are cataloging the first of today too, because the first continue and the woman being the only one in the room is not, you know, it continues as well. So there's definitely many more um, stories to collect. So happy to speak to anybody who's interested in storytelling. Um, yeah, storytelling is great. We should uh, possibly do more of it. Jeremy, final story from you for today. I think, yeah, some, some great comments there from Francesca. I, I think um, I think leadership in professional firms and perhaps accountancy firms in particular it is a challenge as we grow and you have more teams within the business, then leadership becomes more, more critical. The problem is it, it's quite intangible. And as a, a, as a profession, we've grown up and we like to measure things. Um, so, you know, we understand that someone has a technical capability and they'll charge a certain number of hours and that will convert into billing, et cetera, and we can get our head around that. We will recruit someone in an operations role and they've got particular skills in, in this area or that area and we can get our head around that. But leadership is, is more intangible, but I would say it's becoming more important, particularly with as we go back to the war for talent, they really want... Those, those younger guys really want um, some leadership and, and we sometimes under, underestimate as professional firms the importance of that. And certainly leadership and development is a key part of our strategy going forward and we will be investing quite heavily in it so that our team leaders within our business know how to lead as a skill. Great. We've just got literally almost out of time. So a very quick final word from Anne. Um, what, would, what have you taken away from today? And just literally 10 seconds, that'd be great. Um, I think it, it, um, as women, we, we need to voice more what's going on. That's what I'll take away from today. Brilliant. Francesca? From, oh, from me, um, I'll just go, don't accept the status quo. Uh, Dada, what's your thought for final thought everyone here thinks differently excellent well i think unfortunately uh i would love to say we'd like to continue this conversation a bit longer but uh it's not to be so i'd like to thank our wonderful panel from today uh, i'd like to thank Anne harnity who's despite having a bit of a cold i think has um 
done us proud. So thank you very much. And great, great to share those uh, thoughts as well. I'd like to thank Dana for her work. And I didn't mention your charity work. My apologies, because I think what you're doing with 100 years is absolutely amazing. So congratulations on that as well. And do look into that website on Obelisk if you want to understand. Um, I'd like to thank Francesca for um, giving us a lovely story. I will say lovely stories from Francesca. So thank you for that. And, and Jeremy, for your, your insightful and thoughtful. And we are moving to a world of measurement and that must put accountants in a good place because we're quite good at that, aren't we? So on that happy thought, I'd like to leave uh, you for this week. Uh, we're back in two weeks time. Uh, we got Ben Page from Ipsos Mori, who's talking about research. And we've also got... Um, Canada Snow talking about culture and Lee Bryant talking about technology. So a fun show. Missing Francesca, sadly. She's doing other things next in two weeks' time. But we'll be back with you then. And thank you again for being a great audience. And we'll be videos and the poll results, which are quite interesting. That's why nobody wanted to talk about them, maybe. Uh, we'll be back with those in two weeks' time. Bye for now.